in Canada. Um, the club is um, here at uh, Glennon College, part of York University. Um, as a group, uh, we recognize that Glendon is predominantly known for international studies. That's our um, main program. That's what a lot of our students uh, come here to study. But um, a group of us felt that it was important to be aware about social issues within our own country and even in our own community here in Toronto. Um, quick hopes to not only remind students about domestic social issues, uh, but also create a dialogue among students to challenge and explore these issues as well as connecting students with action pro projects, resources, and um, grassroots organizations. So um, today we have um, three speakers that uh, are here today to talk to us. And um, for the first half of our forum, we, uh, we will hear presentations of the speakers, if you don't mind. And um, following the presentation, I guess we'll just have a sort of informal discussion period um, where we can ask questions and, and yeah. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce Anita to introduce our first speaker. So hi everyone. Um, so our first speaker is a Toronto-based lawyer and graduate student from Oscar Hall Law School. His background in labor litigation, student organization, and community legal clinics have given him a unique perspective on emerging issues in the youth labor market. From his experiences in the private, public, and non-profit uh, non sectors, he has gained insights into the range of issues that young workers are facing in a new economy. Uh, he frequently discusses these topics uh, in his website, Youth and Work, which provides youth with knowledge about workplace law and labor market issues. Everyone, please welcome Andrew Langdon. Will tend to be the blind spot of any cult 
culture. Uh, by and large, a culture will not teach its young. Uh, these are the ways in which you can succeed, and these are the ways in which you will fail. These acts are shameful, and these are worthy of honor. And oh yes, one more thing, the entire structure of evaluating the world uh, might uh, cease to make sense. This is not an impossible thought to teach, uh, but is a relatively new idea in the history of cultures, and one, uh, one that we can see why a robust culture would avoid. So uh, let's uh, begin. Um, at the start of the 21st century, we're confronted by numerous challenges. Um, you know, whether you cast our era as one of late capitalism, uh, post-modernity, or neoliberalism, the, the tension and unease are palatable. Uh, things aren't getting better. Uh, rather, for most citizens, uh, with social debt rising, wages stagnating, and the income uh, widening, um, you know, we're not in a good situation. Uh, in all this uh, a while, uh, the pressures of life continue to grow. So my talk is going to cover two main themes. First, I'm going to sketch a theoretical lens from which we can view the changes that have occurred within the youth labor market. And second, I'm going to trace a few changes within the wider economy uh, and society at large uh, that have occurred over the past four decades. Uh, you know, we're going to look at how the prospects of young people have been impaired within the labor force and the labor market. So before we delve into the theory, let's situate where we're currently at. Around the world, uh, you know, in the wake of the financial crisis, we've seen uh, one of the most sustained challenges to the present makeup of the economic order. Uh, from Occupy Wall Street to the Arab Spring to the indigents in Spain, there's been a furious response from young people uh, to a system that's inherently unfair to the vast majority of the global population. Uh, despite this critical response, uh, governments in advanced economies uh, are pursuing bankrupt austerity measures in an attempt to reconsolidate the neoliberal public policy response and first uh, force for the concession from citizens and workers alike. Uh, with this in mind, let's uh, explore some of the various tools uh, that situate the location of young people and the world that they find themselves in at present. So I'm briefly going to run through five tools that I use in my academic research and legal practice to assess various scenarios and fact patterns. These concepts uh, that I'm going to run through are social location, intersectionality, life course analysis, intergenerational equity, and inclusive inequality. Uh, you know, and these ideas will be useful for the second part of my talk uh, to look at where we're at. So firstly, social location is a concept from feminist uh, critical theory that suggests using an analysis uh, that pays close attention to social location social structure, and the social uh, spaces that are created by the intersection of class, race, gender, age, culture, disability, sexual orientation, and so forth. And uh, you know, closely linked to the concept of social location is that of intersectionality. And this idea calls for the legal recognition and delineation of specific status identities. According to intersectionality theory, the different status identities that holders within any social group are differently situated with respect to how much and in the form of uh, the discrimination that they're likely to face. Intersectionality argues that in ascertaining whether a particular individual is a victim of discrimination, courts should pay attention to the specific status identity that the person occupies. Next, let's turn our attention to the concept of life course analysis and intergenerational equity. Life course analysis is rooted in Max Weber's theory of life's chances. Essentially, this theory relates to assessing the impact arising out of class, gender, race, and social mobility, and equality as well. On determining a person's access to resources, the labor market, education, 
and achieving self-actualization. Genuine life course analysis focuses on tracing the temporal trajectories of people's lives in relation to historical, social, and economic events, with a focus on the dynamics vis-a-vis of, uh, of interactions with societal institutions and social structures. Next, interge intergenerational equity is a key aspect of my theoretical toolkit and underpins the majority of my research. Now, what is it? This is a concept that um, fairness must permeate the treatment and interaction between children, youth, adults, and seniors in the context of uh, economic, psychological, and sociological and also legal considerations. Essentially, the way I, that I deploy this theory is, that, is as a lens to assess equality, social justice, legal ramifications arising from decisions in the political, economic, or societal spheres that impact use. And finally, the, 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 the final theoretical theory that I'm going to outline for your consideration is that of inclusive inequality. This is a concept uh, that embraces the lessons of both substantive equality and systemic uh, discrimination. It highlights the ways in which inequality is linked to both uh, the substantive effects of discrimination, including the social, psychological, physical, and economic harms, and the systemic and institutional practices and processes that reproduce it. To survey society using the concept of inclusive inequality, it's necessary to deploy three distinct levels of analysis, micro, meso, uh, meso, and macro. The micro uh, context demands understanding about the, uh, how our own social location experiences inform our understanding and observations uh, and inquiry into the contextual realities of social disadvantage in our lives as individuals or groups. Uh, particularly those without power or privilege. You know, that's um, what the micro level is. Um, also at this level, it's, it's important to connect uh, these narratives to the larger histories and patterns of social inequality. The MESA level relates to institutional systemic inequality. It focuses on the intersection between formal legal norms of equality and non-discrimination, and the informal norms that affect the day-to-day -day practices uh, of the myriad of institutions within our society, such as workplaces, corporations, educational institutions, families, religious organizations, and communities. Finally, the macro level requires an approach that situates specific legal questions and controversies in the larger social, economic, political, and familiar context. So there you have it. These are some of the tools that I use, uh, but they're useless unless uh, we use them to survey some of the changes that have recently impacted these in their economic prospects within Canadian society. So in using the theoretical tools that I just ran through, it's necessary to present a narrative or perhaps a counter-narrative if you will, to the Stephen Harpers or the Dwight Duncans of the world. Uh, the truth is, is that the past 30 years of neoliberal public policy haven't been particularly kind to average citizens like you and me. Let's survey some of the changes in the water economy that are the driving forces behind the deterioration of the new labor market. I've argued before, somewhat controversially, uh, I'll admit, that uh, these changes that we've seen are form a, a kind of strategic abandonment of young people by institutions in advanced industrial economies. Essentially, the economy is leaving behind large swaths of the population of which use form a substantial portion. What's at play here is a meta-narrative of alienation, economic and political exclusion, retrenchment of ameliorative government interventions, and an explicit project of creating winners and losers. So what are some of these specific issues? What are the deeper economic trends?
constraints that are at play. Well, I'm going to put forward a few, and I wouldn't say that this is a comprehensive list by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, first, we have globalization. Second, uh, education within a, a human capital agenda. Uh, the development of a new precariat class within society. The rise of the knowledge economy. And an abandonment of the social welfare state in, in favor of one resembling a neoliberal Hobbesian tragedy. So let's briefly explore some of these developments and survey the impact on the Canadian economy and particularly on young workers. So globalization is one of the most profound developments over the past 50 years. Uh, there's now a global search for cheaper and more flexible labor. Uh, this is linked to producers competing globally for the best price um, and supply-side economics. And it's also linked to the process of de deindustrialization and the movement of jobs from good producing industries to service industries. Um, you know, this has had the impact of transforming the labor market uh, to leave fewer jobs for younger workers. Uh, particularly those with lower levels of education. Uh, consider the growth in industries with low pay, low benefits, low security. Uh, you, know, you can see that in you know, such examples of journalism, um, uh, you know, food service industries, um, you know, tent work, and, and the list goes on. I'm sure um, many of you have worked in these sorts of jobs. Um, I was a duck farmer. Uh, you know, and that wasn't uh, you know the funnest job, but I get to say it was a duck farmer. Um, so the you know this also uh, you know links back to a surge in precarious work. Uh, you know, both in like the water economy uh, in the private sector and within the public sector as well. Uh, you know, in the public sector you, you see them in such in, uh, uh, industries as health or education. You know, um, you know, I'm sure you know, in some of your classes you've seen this through the, the growth of these adjunct uh, professors or uh, contract instructors. Um, so you, you know, that point links up quite nicely to, to the next area, and that's the commodification of post-secondary education uh, within the context of a neoliberal human capital agenda. And this is an area of particular concern. Um, you know, students today are essentially being sold a bill of goods through the big lie that I call, I call it the big lie. Um, you know, that degrees, multiple degrees, and high debt are somehow preparing you uh, for the harsh realities of the new economy. They're not. Uh, this is one of the you know, most under-discussed and serious threats to our economy today. Um, you know, I would say perhaps more so down in the U.S. But you know, consider the you know the idea that uh, you know debt for uh, U.S. students has just topped one trillion dollars. You know that's higher than the cumulative credit card debt for the uh, for the entire U.S. nation. Um, you know what's occurring here is a bubble within higher education that's nearing the point of bursting. Uh, this commodification of uh, education has given students a false message that the, you know, and this is the traditional view, is that if young people improve their uh, human capital, they will gain higher incomes and have access to a fantastic career. This is a false perspective, clearly. And, you know, nearly it's generating a small number of winners alongside a growing number of precarious jobs. So this dovetails nicely into my next point about the development of a precarious class. Now what is this? Essentially, this is a class in the making, which consists of millions of people sharing a similar set of experiences. Now what are uh, the similar set of experiences? It's insecurity, um, you know, flexible, precarious labor without any secure rights or sense of occupational identity. Um, this is the existence um, that you will most likely experience 
been the big school, um, at least for a number of years, um, you know, if you're not already experiencing it and living it right now. Uh, this is a dangerous development. Uh, you know, one just has to look to the riots over in London, uh, England, and you know, some of the surrounding cities last summer um, you know, to see the impact of this sort of existence. And you know, I say that because you know, if you, the, the English riots that, you know, clearly started um, through a, a case of racial profiling that ended up uh, in the death of a, a young black man. But the surge after that was clearly along uh, class lines. And when the riots were perpetrated you know, mainly by young men who didn't have a lot of prospects. Yeah, I think we, you know, we're seeing that in a lot of the other um, confrontations that are occurring uh, globally. So this uh, precaritized mind creates fear, loss of hope, and no sense of the future. Youth uh, lose, lose hope and become disengaged from the political process. And uh, you know, just when it's most important for them to act to secure a better future uh, through their imagination and actions. So the next area that we're going to, to look at is the development of the knowledge economy. Uh, you know, and this is, uh, in Canada, this has led to uh, you know, the creation of two separate labor markets um, over the past 30 years. Uh, you know, one is white collar professions, with access to high-paying salary jobs, and the other, which uh, comprises what would uh, be tra traditionally understood as the labor market, uh, so like service jobs, uh, resource extraction, you know, service industry jobs, um, you know, and so forth. Um, you know, so the development of the knowledge-based economy, uh, with some notable exceptions, normally benefits uh, the boomers. Uh, that were born after World War II, uh, you know, due to their knowledge and experience. And uh, you, know, you can see this uh, occurring in the labor market through the growth of uh, uh, the number of jobs held by people in the 55 plus age demographic. So finally, um, you know, in terms of some of the, the wider changes in the economy, we're going to look at um, the retrenchment of the social welfare state. And this is symbolized by the development of the Washington Consensus, or better known as the Neoliberal Project. In Canada, this is symbolized by the governments of Paul Martin um, as the Minister of Finance under the Correction government, and the government of Mike Harris, who uh, you know, engaged in um, brutal self-inflicted uh, structural adjustment programs that reduced our fiscal capacity to invest in public infrastructure and services, reduced public security for Canadians, and put our economic sovereignty at risk, and also get at our ability to provide our most disadvantaged uh, citizens. You know, and, and I, Say pretty particularly close attention to the economic sovereignty and some of the articles that uh, were in the media today, and you, and you will look um, and see Dalton McGinty out in the media saying that Tim Budak and Rio Horvath are putting Ontario's economic future at risk uh, by jeopardizing uh, the ratings that the credit agencies give us. You know, so, you know, so this is an example of how some corporation has a massive amount of control over our ability as citizens and the ability of our government to provide basic uh, services and de deliver the social contract. Now, let's get to the trends that have been occurring within the youth labor market. Overall, it's increasingly difficult for young people to enter the labor market in a manner that results in a secure and stable job. 
this can be traced back to the high cost of education, debt, uh, mobility problems with an internal migration uh, in Canada, the disappearance of good jobs due to outsourcing um, strategic human resources practices um, you know, just in time production, uh, globalization, and austerity measures uh, which are impacting on the public sector and the ability to hire new workers. Youth have borne the worst brunt of the long-term economic changes uh, within Canada. Uh, we've seen long-term pressures on wages, cause them to rise very slowly in some cohorts, stagnate in others, or in some cases even decrease. Uh, you know, and for the final uh, point there, I would uh, you know, suggest that you, that you look at the wages of young men over the past few decades. They've actually decreased um, from 1980 to the present time. Now, there, I think there's been a, a $500 drop. And, and the, the, this is re real wages. So it's you know, quite frightening. So young people have been buffeted by these recessionary storms over the past few decades. And with each one, you know, we, we see youth put into a more precarious position uh, you know, through program cuts um, you know, that have specifically been left a wizard and died. Uh, you know, and as evidence of that point, I, I would suggest looking at Ontario's most recent labor market development agreement, uh, which moved from providing employment services, um, you know, directly targeting use to an all-ages approach. And this thereby denies the ability to receive targeted programs uh, you know, in, in a setting that they're comfortable in. Now, these are asked to go to employment centers, uh, which cater to adults, seniors, you know, basically the entire labor market, but not directly uh, targeting with them. Um, you know, another uh, recent poignant example is uh, Diane Finley, she's a Minister of Human Resources and Skills Development candidate at the federal level. Uh, her recent decision to slash and eliminate funding uh, for summer youth employment uh, centers across the country. And, you know, and, you know, we're not talking about a large amount of money here. Yeah. The funding was $6.5 million a year. That's um, you know, less than pennies for uh, the federal government, which deals with hundreds of millions of dollars uh, in your budget. So I'd suggest that this long term deterioration of the East labor market and the economic uh, prospectus of, of young people is having a profound impact on the new generation. Amid high education costs, dim job prospects, stagnating wages, uh, the high cost of living, precarious employment, and weakened employment prospects, uh, we're looking at the possible emergence of a lost generation. Uh, much like those in Japan, uh, some countries in Europe, or the Middle East and North Africa, uh, due to the incredible level of economic scarring that has taken place in the wake of the financial crisis and the resulting depression. You know, finally, well, I, you know, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this topic, uh, and that's internships, even though it's the focus of my research, uh, this talk is much more broader in scope. I'm going to offer it up as a closing snapshot of how the labor market, uh, institutions, business societies, and the wider economy are failing them. Founded. Unpaid internships represent a huge threat to the economic prospects of young Ontarians. Uh, you know, we're all operating in, a, in an economy where employers uh, have a carte blanche to violate the Employment Standards Act and other workplace laws through internship schemes, which seek to misclassify uh, young employees as trainees. This thereby denies them the ability to earn a wage, enjoy protections that one gets under the law, and enjoy the benefits of being gainfully employed. Young people today are being primed in high schools, colleges, and universities to believe that unpaid work is normal. But 
you know, in my research, I've come across examples of uh, small businesses, tow large departments, and blue chip corporations. This is within Canada, uh, not talking about the states, predicating entire business models on exploiting the unpaid labor of young workers. While I won't delve into the law today, uh, it's clear that the vast majority of unpaid internships uh, that aren't in the context of an academic program are illegal. Uh, yet, um, to one of the most profound problems within the labor market today, there hasn't been any you know, significant enforcement action from the Ministry of Labor. Uh, and you know, all that signposts uh, you know, this very deep uh, issues in the labor market are a small number of cases. Uh, you know, and that's very troubling because you know, what you're looking at here is perhaps uh, one of the most uh, profound and largest examples of wage theft in the modern era. So what we're seeing here is a concrete example of, uh, of the breakdown and the violation of any notion of inclusive equality or intergenerational equity. Uh, you know, that exploits the social location and the occupational status of young people. Um, you know, all in an attempt to line the pockets of businesses, uh, both large and small. So, in closing, I'd ask you to consider the quote that I, I opened with uh, the, the talk and consider, uh, you know, critically uh, what sort of future we're being prepared for here in this institution and how individually and collectively you can bring about the changes that I'm sure you all want to see in society. Thank you.